All right, so we've now seen how valid manifestation is, and especially with regards to one's personal frequency, and we've discussed some really eye-opening examples of all this in action. So the big question is, what does all this say about reality? Yeah, and we can dig into this question from different angles. For starters, we have the quantum physics interpretation of how it all works. The past being fluid, and the present being under the influence of different probable futures. Then we have the simulation theory, which is that this is all a program in some way, that everything that we experience is all part of programmed rules. And finally, we have the collective dream idea, which is that there is a kind of higher universal subconscious that's projecting all of this. And each of these theories has evidence to back it up. And they're not all mutually exclusive either, so it's really just, it all just really comes down to how do you slot quantum physics simulation theory, and the collective dream theory into a bigger meta framework. So that's what I want to get into. So let's start with the quantum physics and time angle, because there's definitely that element involved. And the first big part of that, the first big aspect, is that if you, if you look at how manifesting works, how synchronicity works, one of the things that you'll realize is that the past is fluid. In other words, the past itself can somehow be changed or influenced or selected after the fact in some way. One of the ways that you can realize this is that when you manifest something or when you have a synchronicity, oftentimes the physical cause, the, the physical chain of cause and effect that leads up to it started in the past. And not just weeks in the past, it can be years, if not even decades in the past, that leads to the very thing that you're manifesting now, even though you chose to only try to manifest it, let's say, a day ago. Yeah, or and you a week ago. a really good example of that. Well, yeah. You got your computer. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, this very computer that I'm recording on now, it's a Mac Pro, like a, an older one. So what happened was um, I used to be on a Mac Mini, like a 2010 Mac Mini, and I did music on it. I did some stuff on it, but it's getting just way too slow for, for what I needed. I needed something way more powerful to start making videos and record music with bigger tracks because, you know, I'm, I'm into like symphonic metal, so I need the orchestras and all these different multi-layers. So anyway, I needed something better and bigger, but there was nothing that was small enough to fit on my desk. I needed something compact because I try not to have too much big stuff, generally speaking. So I wanted something powerful, ultra compact, still a Mac, but better than a Mac Mini. And it wasn't until like a month after that that they announced the 2013 Mac Pro, which everyone hated because it wasn't expandable. You couldn't put your own video cards in there. And uh, it wasn't like huge and expandable like the old Macs. It was small compact, powerful, exactly what I needed. And it was like so far out of line from anything else that they had done that people were wondering like, what the heck is this? But it was perfect for me. It's exactly what I needed. So sorry to everyone that I manifested <laughs> the, the wrong Mac for you guys, but I needed it. Yeah. And it looks like, like a cylinder and it's like a hematite color. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe that was just coincidence. I'm kind of, I'm kind of half joking, but what, what I'm not joking about is how I got the money for it. Because what happened was my, my German grandma, she died not too long before that. And so I desperately needed this computer and I was kind of focusing on it, like, you know, visualizing me having it and everything that I could do with it. Well, one day my dad emails me, my German dad, he emails me and uh, he says, oh, hey, uh, by the way. Yeah. And this was like a year after she had died. I remembered that. Mm -hmm. So it took a year. Yeah. For him to figure out what you're about to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was kind of cleaning up the her business in Germany, getting all the papers sorted, going through her stuff and and he discovered that she had a she had opened a savings account for me a long time ago. And I guess you can kind of predict where this leads. <laughs> but he says, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and close the account and have the money transferred to you. So you know, expect to see that. Yeah, she just opened it when you were a kid. I do remember her having a, a little piggy bank and putting like five marks in it every time I was over. And then this is back in like 1984, 1985. Mm -hmm. so this is a long time ago. And I never knew what the money was going to be used for. right? But here I am like 30 years later desperately needing this computer, which I've used now for 10 years, and it's still fast. It's done everything that I need, needed to. Uh, yeah, so he transferred the money, and when I checked it, it was almost down to the dollar exactly what I needed for this new computer with the particular RAM and hard drive upgrades and the video card upgrade. Wow. Yeah, so, but you got to wonder, like, what came first, right? Was I a kid, and was I always destined to have some computer that wasn't even invented yet? Or... Did I need that computer and somehow it popped into the timeline and now the past got influenced or changed in some way, along with my memory of her putting the five marks in the little piggy bank. Um, 
I mean, all the timing had to come together for that to even happen, you know? So that's, that's, an, that's an interesting example of how the past seems to be influenced from the present. And that actually reminds me, I'm just thinking of it as we're talking, like the, because the amount, it was 5,000 and, and change. So it was like literally the exact amount that you needed. And actually reminds me of that anecdote we told earlier in our discussion about when I got the $260 when my carburetor conked out. And then the past got changed, I guess you could say, I don't know, but where I got that extra bonus money. Um, in my check, that was an accident, but it was the exact amount, almost to the dollar of what I needed. So I just realized, yeah, that's another example of past getting changed and you get what you want and mm -hmm. lines up to the dollar amount. Yeah. So. Yeah. And quantum physics. But yours is yeah. better. That was a better <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to say is that the quantum physics does allow for, well, see, there's a debate about whether in quantum physics, there's such a thing as retro causality, the idea that the present or the future can influence the past. And there are some experiments that seem to support it, but then there's always these skeptics that try to explain like why that's not necessarily the case. Uh, I don't want to get into the technical details of it, but I mean, it does involve entanglement, decoherence, uh, the, these types of terms. But ultimately, what it all comes down to is no matter what the physics does, no matter what entangles with what, um, in the end, you, the conscious observer, are the one who has the final say. That's where that chain of that the chain of cause and effect stops. It stops with you, the final observer, and selecting what past timeline, what past particular version of the timeline you're kind of locking into and, and, and experiencing right now in the present, which then in turn affects what happens in the future. So there's definitely something to that about the past being mutable or being fluid. Uh, and like I said, my memory of her putting the money in the piggy bank, well, a skeptic would say, well, okay, well, then, then obviously... It was always meant to be that you would have that money eventually and you just happen to need a computer and time for it. On the other hand, uh, if you look at, which is something I'll touch in, uh, in in a bit, is that when you're inside of a dream, many times you can remember things, have very vivid memories of how things are, how things were, how things are supposed to be. But it turns out that that memory in itself is dreamt up. You see, it's not like you had an earlier dream where you experienced it and then later in the dream you remember, oh yeah, that's what I experienced earlier in the dream. Not at all. It's like... You have a memory out of nowhere of a past, but that memory itself is fabricated. And that happens in a dream, and it's, it feels so real. So imagine if you're awake, you have a memory. Well, can you trust that memory? How real is reality? How real is the past? Mm. If the past changes and our memory changes along with it, well, we would never know, would we? Unless, of course, you get deja vus or Mandela effect, glitches, things like that. But that's, those are like edge cases. For most people, their memories could be changing all the time and they wouldn't even know it, you know? And that's because we are locked into the intellect, into the body, into space and time, linear time. And uh, we, are, we are too reliant on our physical brain and our linear memories for what we conceive of as reality and our five senses. And that ties into the Hindu idea of reality being Maya, an illusion, or Plato's cave with a shadow on the wall. You know, it's all shadow play, ultimately. And we're trying to figure out, like, okay, well, how much of this is real? And how much of this actually isn't really real. If the timeline does change for you, like, okay, like, so in my case, let's say between one day and the next, the past got rewritten. So now all of a sudden I've got several thousand dollars for a new computer because of something that happened 30 years ago, but 30 years ago in this new alternate past that just came into existence. Well, the question then is, well, if the past changes for me, what about for everyone else? Like, what does that mean? Everyone else's reality gets changed along with me? And I would say, well, it ultimately doesn't matter because if that's the only variable that changed, then what difference does it make to anyone else? Like their memories are not going to change because their past and that new, and that, because their memory and that new timeline is exactly the same as it was a day ago or a week ago. The only thing that changed is my memory and my past and my consequence, therefore, in terms of uh, getting the money for the computer. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, everyone's past could be constantly changing because of one person or another person, but if it doesn't change for them personally in their life, then it doesn't really matter. So that's kind of how I view it. It's definitely supported by, by quantum mechanics. Uh, and one of the things that quantum physics says, though, is that if you don't observe something, if you don't check in on it, if you don't measure it, then essentially it's fluid. It's open. It's not decided yet, right? It's like the, that Schrodinger's cat example. Mm -hmm. Before you open the box, you don't know if the cat is dead or alive. So therefore, quantum physics says it's both. Uh, but what that really means, though, is that you have two alternate timelines, one where the cat is alive, one where the cat is dead, and both of them are intertwined and uh, sort of in, in a nebulous state. 
And then when you actually finally check on it, that's when your, I guess your subconscious or maybe the, the higher demiurge, the higher subconscious of the universe, that's when it like clicks into place and causes one of those things to, to manifest. It's, it's interesting how, therefore, the things that you can manifest or the things that you can change about the past, it's not necessarily what you remember about the past that gets changed, um, but it's also the things that you never checked on in the first place. Like, I never really verified over the past many decades whether she still has the account or whether she sent it to me or what she did with that money, for example. So it was totally open, at least to my awareness. So when the need finally arose, uh, it, didn't, it didn't violate the plausibility of this fictional narrative that we're all experiencing. It didn't violate the, the storyline, the plot, in order for that to be written in. You know, it's kind of like, it's kinda like if, a, if a novel is already fully written, but the author decides, oh shoot, I want to add this, this one part to it. But in order to have this part, I need to change something earlier in the, in the book. So he goes in and he kind of like scribbles in the margins, kind of writes something in between two other sentences a couple hundred pages earlier. As long as it fits, as long as it doesn't violate the plot of the time, then th that's not a big deal, right? And in television, they do this thing called retconning, and that's where they come up with some new ad hoc thing later on in some other season, and then they kind of retcon, they re recontextualize something that happened in earlier seasons to try to make it seem like, oh, they planned it all along, but they didn't. You know, they just put a new spin on it. Mm. And then I think sometimes we can add things to the past that put a new spin on the past, which then affects the present and therefore the future. That's one aspect of the whole quantum physics side of it. But another thing that that then ties into, because this, this has to do with the past. Now I want to talk about the future and how is it that we seem to then attract different types of probable futures. Uh, and that all depends on your, your personal frequency, your mindset, your vibe. And of course, the New Agers, they have this thing about you attract what you resonate with, which is you know, it's generally true. Like you do attract what you resonate with, but they don't really define what does resonance mean, what is actually vibrating. And you can get into quantum physics to try to understand how that might actually happen. And so my, my personal theory about how that works is that essentially you have your emotional energy, your mental, your psychic energy, all these things, because they're not fully physical, therefore they're not locked into linear time. And so therefore they can travel through time, they can ripple through time forwards, backwards, possibly even sideways across parallel timelines. And so what that means then is that the past, the present, and the future, they can all influence each other because our own consciousness was in the past and now it's in the present and it will be in the future, right? But because we're conscious along all of it, all these different aspects of consciousness can interact with each other. So that's how you get the past, present, and the future all um, interacting with each other and essentially sending some sort of energy back and forth. We know just from cause and effect, like you push a domino, it hits the next domino and so on into the future. We know from, from causality that the past influences the present, which influences the future. That's like a one-way direction of time. And that's what everyone knows what linear time is. Like you know that if I eat too much today, I'll be a little bit fatter tomorrow. That's causality. But the thing is, the future then also seems to influence the past and the present through some sort of a feedback loop. It's a, it's a bundle of feedback loops because the future is open. It's not just one future that we're moving into. There's many different futures that we have. You could have like a dozen different futures, a dozen different ways of how things can happen, let's say, in one day or even in the next moment, uh, depending on how things go. And if influences travel through time, then each one of those probable futures has its own feedback loop, sending energy back in time into you right now in the present. And so I think that's why if something terrible is about to happen or even something really good, uh, you'll start feeling that emotion already before it happens. It's almost like precognition or some sort of a foreshadowing, some sort of an influence from the future might be coming back and making you feel a certain way about it right now. So if the most probable future is a really positive one, let's say, let's say you're deciding on whether or not you should start a particular project or make a particular social media post or call someone and check in and see how they're doing. You could decide to do that or you could decide not to do it. And those are two different probable futures. Well, if you tune into that future where you do do it and you have this really good feeling like, yeah, well, is that just intuition? Or are you actually looking in the direction of the future that's sending energy back to you so you're starting to feel already the good emotions that you have in that future when you go through with it? So let's say you do make that choice and, uh, wow, you affect a lot of people with that social media post or um, the person that you called definitely needed a, a welfare checkup and you know emotional checkup and they're really happy that you called and you have a really great energizing conversation, right? So that energy that you're experiencing might be rippling out through time 
and you might have been already picking up on that earlier in time. So these different probable futures then, it's like a, it's like a bundle of feedback loops that are coming back into the present. And so therefore, essentially what you, what you have is you have like multiple timelines affecting multiple timelines, multiple futures affecting not only your present, but also your past. And it's this really complicated web of trans-temporal influences. That might be how complicated it actually gets. If you really want to get into quantum physics and try to figure out how it works, you might have to go down that route. Now, there's a vibrational signature that you can hold right now in the present moment that kind of makes you more responsive to one probable future instead of another. So, like I said, if, if one probable future, you're doing really great, you're really happy, and then another one, you're so disappointed, you're depressed, you're sad. Well, each one of those carries a certain vibrational energy pattern that's radiating out through time, and then you in the present would be picking up on both of those simultaneously, but the thing is, just like a radio, when you tune it to a certain station, what you're really doing is you're, you're changing the resonant frequency of the radio circuitry to be more easily energized by one radio station instead of another. And so that's what radio tuning actually is. That's how you're able to hear that station is because it's like a two-way resonance that's going on. And so maybe something like that might be happening too in real life with us by whatever resonance that you hold, whatever you respond to, whatever your, your base character, emotional mindset, emotional climate is within you, you're going to resonate with one of those probable futures more than another. And maybe that two-way energy flow then allows that probable future to, um, to manifest, to precipitate. Yeah, so I think that might be how it works. But of course, you're only really drawing in a, a resonance match. Like say you resonate with a pattern of overwhelming surprise and happiness over, let's say, money. And this attracts a probable future where you feel that due to something financial that happens that's positive. Um, there's an interesting uh, monkey's paw aspect to it where what you're doing is you're only manifesting the future where you feel that. You're not necessarily manifesting the future where you're actually rich. It's only where you think you're rich. See, because that's the you, that's a probable version of you in the future that's experiencing it. And so what can sometimes happen though is you, you manifest something that confirms exactly what you wanted to manifest. And so therefore it's, it's a resonance match, but it turns out not to be what you thought it was going to be. And so you don't get dis disappointed until later on, until you discover that, oh shoot, that was just, let's say, a Nigerian prince who offered you a million bucks. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but, 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 but some, something that's not truly real. See, it, it proves that reality creation and manifesting works, but it also indicates, though, that you're not manifesting the exact thing. You're manifesting more of a, along the lines of a resonance principle, and which then supports the idea that our emotions and our mindset is rippling out through time, including from the future into the past. So that's what we're picking up on, that's what we're connecting with, and I think that's what ends up locking that probable future into happening. It's not that you're manifesting the exact thing, it's just a resonance match pattern which attracts it. So, so this shows that reality does bend according to consciousness, but it's not always necessarily in the best way. Uh, not to mention, you know, there can be negative entities that use the opportunity to play to your expectations and to trip you up. So it might be that the first opportunity that comes your way, it may not actually be the right one. It could be like a, like a counterfeit that's sent early on to kind of to make you think that that's what it is, but it actually isn't. My mom, when uh, she has a lot of Christian wisdom, she used to say that, you know, be, be kind of suspicious about the first thing that comes your way. Because a lot of times that's like the, like the, it's like, a, like the devil trying to trip you. Yeah. No, I didn't know she'd said that, but I agree because I can think I have had stuff like that too. The first thing, it's like it's enthusiastically jumping into your path, but it's not the right one or the good one. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you have to really trust your intuition and your logic when it comes to that. Because what the entities hinge on is the idea that you already have uh, an expectation. You're already so anticipating it and you're already like kind of like grasping for it. Mm -hmm. And that's ego. That's That's attachment. And so that creates a karmic or spiritual opening for you to be deceived. So if you're more patient and you're more in touch with your intuition, then you're not going to fall for that. See, and, and it also speaks to, to the idea of doubt. Like if you have a lot of doubt and insecurity about this power of consciousness over reality, then of course, as soon as the first thing comes up, you're going to jump on it because you think like, well, shoot, I don't want to let this slip away necessarily. And so you start ignoring your intuition, you ignore your, your wisdom, you're, you're on the train of Ego, wishful thinking, insecurity, doubt, fear. And then, like I said, that's what opens the door to the trick to happen in the first place. So yeah, I mean, as long as you're patient and you're intuitive, um, 
you know that if it's not the right one. And sometimes you can start moving in that direction. Maybe you start nibbling on the bait, but you don't swallow it fully. And you can get a bad taste. You can tell that it's not the right thing. So, yeah, and, you know, and sometimes, um, I think I might have mentioned this earlier, how negative entities, they can also manufacture artificial synchronicities to play to your wishes, your wishful thinking. Yeah. Right? Um, and then they always go overboard with it because they don't want to invest all that energy and time and loosh to try to make that thing happen and then not have you bite it because it's too subtle and like it goes right over your head. No, I mean, they make it really garish, like the pen example. And, well, and, actually, the bold... I don't know if we even talked about this earlier, but remember the boulder is better incident? Right. I, I think that was a great one that really uh, illustrates what you're talking about here. And I don't know if we actually got into that earlier in the in sense of details. But I mean, you, just in a nutshell, just to, I'm not sure if we mentioned it, so I might be reiterating, but um, the summary is that we were considering, like, oh, if we were... This is when we lived in Charlottesville. If we were to leave Charlottesville, what are some other places we'd want to live? And we were trying to like do our research about other places in the country. And at the time, we were thinking not only Colorado, but Boulder seemed like a really good area, maybe. And, you know, this was around 2010-ish, um, so a while ago. But, yeah, we were thinking Boulder, maybe. And we kind of, that it was like on a short list for us. And then right after we thought that, you know, long story short, there was this guy that you knew when we'd hung out with once named Paul. And then after you guys had a, a phone call where you were talking about all kinds of different things, he followed up that phone call with an email to you where the subject line just said only Boulder is better and spelled Boulder as in Boulder, Colorado, not Boulder, B-O-L-D-E-R, but B-O-U-L-D-E-R. Boulder is better. And he had no idea of our, you hadn't told him that we were, you know, thinking of alternate places besides Charlottesville and where would we go and maybe Boulder. And so right then, I mean, you get this email just kind of hitting you over the head, like Boulder is better. I mean, just not only about Boulder, but telling you it is better. And it's just like, I'm like trying to desperately get us to go there, you know, like, and if you're naive, um, then unfortunately you might take that as a sign from higher things that are good but luckily me and you are kind of paranoid and suspicious and we, we see both sides of things. We're always considering the both, you know, not just only the naive new age perspective. So, of course, we're immediately suspicious, like, hmm, you know, and in the end, yes, it's a very good thing we did not go to Boulder. So, yeah, never regretted that decision. I don't think it was right at all, but it's kind of like something trying to lure you on the wrong path, maybe. So, yeah, you got to be you got to be careful of that. You know, mm -hmm. these artificial negative synchronicities and a lot. Again, a lot of new agers do not want to acknowledge anything negative in life in general, but they definitely don't want to acknowledge negative o omens and signs and things. Everything always has to be viewed through this positive lens, which is it's not how life is. There's a lot of negative stuff here, trickster stuff. And, you know, it, especially for certain people that might be more on the radar of these negs and a higher target than other people. Um, and that would, you know, be us. And we're definitely more on the radar maybe than a lot of other people. And so stuff is very keen to just kind of maybe try to lure us away from the better, optimal, positive future and kind of maybe look to derail. So, you know, and there's been a few other instances, I won't sidetrack into it, that were like that synchronicity, but that one's a really good mm -hmm. one, I think, that really illustrates what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So we have to keep in mind that even though there are physical or occult principles behind how consciousness influences reality, despite that, there are also entities that can make use of that process, that can insert themselves into the loop to try to preempt it or try to take advantage of it. And, and so there, therefore, you know, just because it's reality creation doesn't mean it can't be hijacked in some way or can't be utilized towards uh, suspicious ends that we have to be careful of. Yeah. And that's, that's the whole point too, because uh, it trains discernment, it trains free will to have to uh, decide between whether you're listening to your ego-based wishful thinking or listening to your intuition and you know, your true self, your true intelligence within. We're always being confronted with that choice. Uh, and, and reality creation and these weird phenomena are just another arena where that sort of sifting takes place. Oh, and what I forgot to mention that makes it even more valid of what I was trying to say about the boulder is better thing, the source as well. I didn't mention this when I was telling the story, but Paul, and he was a questionable person. I mean, he means well. He was a nice guy, but he was unstable. He was emotionally and mentally unstable. 
So he, he wasn't like a regular person. He was a little out there, you know, and he was not in control of his emotions. So I, he would have been someone that would be easy to work through. If, if Negs are looking for a way in, he would have been an easy target. He could vector because he's kind of weakened and kind of unstable. So anyway, that was important to yeah. mention. No, no, it's true because one of the things that Negs do very easily is telepathically steer someone who's open, who's mentally open. Right, and he was really loose. <laughs> Mm-hmm. like unstable ish yeah he was not not a regular guy so yeah yeah and that's why a lot of the gang stalking stuff for example it does happen through homeless people or through crazy people mm-hmm. on the streets yep who are easily taken over yeah or, or spoken through exactly yeah there's definitely a discernment to be had in all of this all right so getting back to the question of what is reality actually uh so far i've gotten into the quantum physics aspect the timeline dynamics explanation but really we need to go deeper than that because what is it that generates that physics in the first place what is it that creates that timeline aspect that that timeline dynamics in the first place Uh, what is it that's ultimately behind space and time and all of its rules in other words what actually is the fundamental reality behind reality now that kind of gets philosophical because we have to think about what is it how, how is it that how do we define what is real like what do people mean when they say real And typically what we mean is that something is real if it's independent of our minds. In other words, it's not something that we can just imagine on the fly. Because if you you just imagine something, that's not real. See, reality is something that you can't simply imagine. Something that exists out there and not just in our minds. It's tangible. Yes, that that is the definition of tangible, Mm -hmm. objective, independent material, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of subjective, which tends to be like imagination, your personal whims, and so on. But um, you can exist inside of an illusion that is functionally real, but not actually real, right? It can function like it's real. And, and a good example of that would be dreams. You can be in a dream, but things can feel quite solid, you know? But that's happening inside your head, supposedly. So how, how is it that reality, then, is any, any different? But let's think about it for a moment, though. Let's say, let's say that reality is a simulation, then what would you expect if reality is a simulation? Well, you would expect that because it is programmed, because it's, it's some, some sort of a computer, whether a physical computer or some sort of a metaphysical consciousness computer, if it's operating as a simulation, then it would have to operate based on rules, on logic, on mathematics. That's one of the conditions of being a simulation. And it would have to have memory in the sense of being persistent, stable, uh, precise, And the way it works would have to be based on functions and processes, just like a computer program, right? There's functions, there's different kinds of processes, there's variables, there's constants. So like in physics, what do you, what do you learn in physics? You learn about the physical constants of reality, like the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the electric constant and programming. Likewise, you start out your program with different types of constants, like numbers that are set in stone that you're going to use throughout the program. So what if we are in a simulation and there is a constant called the speed of light, and then no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, the speed of light is going to be constant, at least in the vacuum, you know, and then it gets modified based on material properties and and so on. And the same thing goes for quantum physics, because all of quantum physics is based on this thing called the quantum wave function, which is a, well, they say it's just a, a mathematical object that describes all the possible probable future states of a particular system, whether it's an electron, an atom, a molecule, whatever, it has a wave function that encodes its energy, its position, its momentum. All these different physical traits are encoded in the wave function. But the quantum wave function, you can write it out mathematically. If it's a simple system, you can actually figure out what it is mathematically. And when you have it written out like that, that is no different from an algorithm in a program. So we, we look at something, we say, oh, that's a hydrogen atom. Well, is it really? Or is it just a bunch of code that creates the function of a hydrogen atom, which is what the wave function does in quantum physics? Now, what quantum physics doesn't do in terms of mathematics is predict how you are going to perceive that particular atom. Like, are you going to perceive it with a a spin that's upwards or downwards? You know, or is it going to be this state or that state? That's undecided. And the same thing with a computer program. You write the program, but the way the person interacts with it, you can't, you don't know how they're going to choose what menu selection or in a video game like how what place in the within the game they're going to go right isn't it interesting then how much overlap there is between programming and computer programs 
and reality. So you could say that reality is pretty much like a simulation. And it's interesting then how it overlaps with dreams, because in dreams, there is also a kind of physics, if you think about it. Like, if you're in a dream and you're walking around, you're not thinking about it, but you're walking on a ground. So there's gravity. There is some sort of a solidity that repels your feet from the ground so you don't fall through the ground, right? There's something solid there. You can pick up an object in a dream and throw it, and most of the time it'll go and then it'll bounce off the, off the ground, right? Um, when you hear things in a dream, what is there some kind of a dream air that is passing dream sound to your dream eardrums? Mm. Well, the, the true answer is not really. It's a simulation of it. And then, but, but then you think, well, well then what about waking reality? Sure, you can use a microphone to measure sound, but what if it's a dream microphone measuring dream sound? <laughs> it's, it's no different from being in a dream, right? So, so beyond all the mathematics, beyond all the rules of physical reality, it seems to me that there is something more fundamental that is just consciousness. It shows that physics is um, it's part of the fiction as well. But more than that, though, you, you got to wonder, like, how is it then that our mind generates physics within a dream? Well, it was probably programmed into us since birth by everything that we experienced. Because, see, I remember being a baby. I remember looking at my hands for one of the first times and trying to figure out like how to make it do things. Right? So initially, I had no connection to my hands. I had no understanding of how that worked because that part of my consciousness had been wiped. You know, Maybe I knew it in a past life, but of course, when you get born into a new body, all that mechanical stuff, which is unique to the brain, unique to your programming, gets kind of wiped. So that's the part that's, that gets wiped and I had to relearn it all over again. And so because I grew up and I learned how to walk, I learned about gravity and, you, you know, you can't go through walls because you're going to bonk your head, right? You can't just fly away. <laughs> yeah, you can't just fly away. You dream about flying away. You have these magical dreams as a kid because you remember another realm where you could do that, but you can't. And so over time, physical reality programs your mind into expecting that. And so when you're asleep, dreaming, I think that your subconscious projects a dream environment according to that programming. So dream physics is programmed, so it's reflexive. Like your subconscious doesn't have to think about it. It doesn't have to think about, oh shoot, now I gotta make gravity here, and I can make gravity there and make sure he doesn't fall through the floor. There's no consciousness to it. It's just a reflexive action, which is, oh, wall cannot go through. You know, so it's an instant program. But that program is happening within consciousness of your own mind. Right? It's not ones and zeros on some silicon microchip somewhere. It's happening in your own mind. And that's interesting because what about waking reality? What if the physics of this waking reality is exactly the same thing in the sense that it is a universal subconscious that has been, some part of it has been programmed to reflexively create the functional illusion of an objective physical reality, right? So maybe dreams, or maybe waking reality and dreams are two sides of the same coin or two, two ends of the same spectrum. Like the title of my article. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I have an article on my website in Two Worlds, and it's called Dream Time uh, versus Waking Life, Two Sides of the Same Coin. So I explore these concepts, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, you talk about it pretty in depth in that article. Yeah. Like yeah, and I, and, I, yeah. <laughs> and I've come at it from my own angle, too, my own experiences, but it all, seeps, it all keeps converging onto the same fundamental point, which is that everything is consciousness. Yeah, well, and, you explain it way better because you really get into the quantum stuff. I don't understand that myself, so... Yeah. Yeah, see, now the quantum stuff is interesting, right? Because it has to do with, oh, changing the past and tapping into different feedback loops from different probable futures. But see, that is still operating within the fictional programming of consciousness itself. See, beneath that is all consciousness. And, of course, the, the Hindus, in their cosmology, you do have the idea, like I said earlier, that everything is illusion. There's this veil of Maya that disguises the true universal consciousness that is behind it. Um... But I think even they, because they, they lacked the, they lacked computer programming, they lacked quantum physics, so they didn't have the right metaphors or mm -hmm. understanding to really get into the details of it. But we have the luxury of that now. Yeah. See, and that's why I'm talking about this, because we have perspective, I think, that is very helpful. The, the programming metaphor, actually, you know what? It's probably not even a metaphor. It's probably actual literal reality <laughs> in the sense that there is something that is open or blank that can be programmed to behave a certain way. And that's how we get physical reality as we think of it. But... Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing that is objective here in terms of matter, energy, space, or time, um, none of that is truly objectively real. It only functions objectively real. 
And what that means, though, however, is that it's not permanently, objectively, functionally real. Because at some point, the rules can change. At some point, the plug can be pulled on this so-called simulation or this collective dream could end. And all that physics, all that matter, energy, space, and time will go poof. And, and then the fact that there are things like glitches in the program and these weird anomalies and just things that happen that are not possible by the, the known laws of physics, and yet they're happening here. And that in itself gives away and shows that what you're saying is is accurate. Like, it's functioning as it's real most of the time, mm -hmm. almost all of the time. But there's going to be those moments where there's these glitches and these anomalies and things that are not possible according to what we're taught about physics. And that gives it away that it isn't actually fully real. It's just mimicking realness. Yeah, yeah, because normally waking reality is stable and relatively mundane. That's how it is for billions and billions of people every single day, pretty much most of the day of their lives, okay? Because um, they're, they're coloring within the lines. They're existing within the most probable part of this whole, this whole quantum thing that we're in. But sometimes there's something else something deeper, something more real that is breaking through that illusion. And as you just said, that's when we get the glitches. That's mm -hmm. when we get the synchronicities, the omens. Just and reality doing things it's not supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And therefore, that shows like, okay, well, then what is real? Is it physics that's real? Or is it consciousness that's ultimately real? It's consciousness that is ultimately real. And physics is just something that's being emulated within it. And the fact that it's being emulated is the reason why consciousness, in its true sense, can break through that and cause... Cause unexpected things to happen here. Anomalies. So the anomalies always give away the illusion mm -hmm. because they point to something that's higher, that's beyond that illusion. And actually, like even even if you're researching things, um, it's always good to look for the counterexamples, the anomalies, things that don't fit, because there are always doorways to a higher truth that you know you're missing out on if you just buy into the, the majority consensus viewpoint. You know. So to, to kind of round that out, what I wanted to do is I wanted to compare how dreams and waking reality overlap in strange ways. Just kind of summarize it all and put it all together. So just as there can be physics in a dream, right? There can be dream elements in the waking world, which shows that there's an interesting overlap between the two. For example, when you're dreaming, you can change your vibes or your mindset or your intentions, and, uh, and then the dream starts changing in response to that. Likewise, when you're awake, you can change your vibes and your intentions and what you experience in life changes. What you attract in life changes. It's just like in a dream, but it happens way more slowly. It takes more time. It's almost like um, there's way more inertia and resistance in waking reality versus in dreams. But there's still you know, a lot of overlap too. So that's one. Another example is when you're dreaming, you can get some really bizarre things happening. There's some really strange things happening in dreams that are just pretty wacky, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when awake, you can get some very bizarre synchronicities very bizarre matrix glitches or if you get into the john keel type phenomena uh you can get the weirdest creatures coming out of nowhere and people <laughs> seeing them and all hell breaks loose like in point pleasant west virginia which yeah. is what the mothman prophecies book was all about yeah They're the whole cryptozoology thing mm -hmm. yeah so i mean I, would, I do wonder like if some of these creatures that came through did they even pre-exist yeah or were they just kind of pulled from the sea of quantum possibility these spurious quantum possibilities where they manifested um, due to everything that was going on during that time. It was, it was like, a, like a, it kind of reminded me of the, that garbage patch in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. you know, there's this big garbage patch. It's, big, it's due to the water circulating around, right? So it's like a maelstrom, like a giant maelstrom. So you get all this garbage accumulating right in the middle. Like this weird anomaly in the middle of the ocean. Well, what if that happens in time as well? where there's this event, like in the, in the case of West Virginia, it was that bridge collapse. Yeah, the Silver Bridge collapsing. Yeah, yeah which killed a lot of people. It killed like dozens and dozens uh, of people. Yeah, I was like, yeah, 30 something, 36 people or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so there's this weird thing that was coming up. And prior to that, actually a lot of the people that died on that bridge were people that had paranormal experiences. Yeah, they had seen the Mothman. Like, it, yeah, for basically for 13 months leading up to that the bridge collapse, um, Mothman was uh, visiting Point Pleasant. You know, all the various people in Point Pleasant were having these sightings. There was also men in black that were showing up, acting really strange, knocking on people's doors, you know, doing their men in black thing, and just all kinds of... Cre I mean, I really highly recommend this book, by the way, The Mothman Prophecies by John Keel. Amazing book, love it. One of my faves, definitely should get it, But because he chronicles all the woo-woo that was happening for over a year, just before the bridge collapsed, including Mothman and these strange thing, you know, sightings of... Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 And the movie was only loosely based on it. Yeah. It was a modern, it, it, they changed the time period, made it happen in modern times. And, um, the book is amazing. I actually like the movie too. I do like both for their own reasons, but I highly recommend the book. Mm-hmm. People should check it out if they haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So John Keel definitely got into the more, uh, bizarre side of reality, mm-hmm. which they call Freudian phenomena. Cause yeah, and, yeah. and the sync started happening to everybody in, on a group level. That's what he also noticed that he had a group of people he was in regular contact with, um, during this 13 months before the bridge actually collapsed. And this is of course, before the internet. So, you know, you're not online, it's all over the phone. You're calling people on the phone or you're writing letters to each other, but all these strange synchronicities started happening to everybody in this group that were talking to each other on the phone or writing to each other in the mail. Um, so yeah, it was it, it, the whole group synchronicity started happening. That was the most interesting, one of the most interesting aspects of the book to me to, to see that, you know, that this is a thing, like a group of people that start being, focusing their consciousness on the same weird woo stuff. They start syncing up and then reality gets really weird for all of them collectively. Like they start becoming part of this little subset of the dream, you know, or all the weird things are happening to just them, you know, together. It's really interesting. Yeah. Well, it's just like when you have a bad dream, for example, and the more scared you are of the thing that you're experiencing like the nightmare the the worse the nightmare gets because it's mm-hmm. this weird self-reinforcing feedback loop between your subconscious and your your conscious player i guess within that experience mm-hmm. so i think something like that can happen in, in real life as well so yeah i mean that's another example um what else well when dreaming for example uh you can have these really deep repressed emotions and, and blocks in your subconscious that can lead to those nightmares you know speaking of nightmares and likewise when you're awake those exact same repressed emotions and blocks can lead to misfortunes and suffering and nightmarish uh, outcomes to, to your life. So that's kind of weird that in dreams you can precipitate a nightmare, and in waking life you can also precipitate a nightmare, but it's not as cartoonish as it would be in a dream, mm-hmm. and it takes longer because there's more inertia in reality, uh, in waking reality, um, but the same principle applies. So what else? Well... As I mentioned earlier, when dreaming, even your memories can be made up. Even your memories can be part of the dream. And as I, as I said, you know, when you're awake, your past can be changed. But if your memory goes along with it, then you don't notice it. So likewise, you can remember a past that didn't actually originally happen. I mean, it happened now. If you were to check on it, you can go, you can go check and see, yeah, you know, are the records of it? Yeah, of course there are. But that's part of that new alternate timeline that has been inserted or, you know, things have been changed to that. Mm-hmm. But like I said, the same thing happens in dreams when you remember something that didn't actually happen in a dream. <laughs> the biggest one of all is when you're dreaming, you are surrounded. You, you constantly get these, these symbolic, these dream symbols that speak to a deeper message from your subconscious. So you can get synchronicities, you can get omens. Yeah, you get all these, these signs in dreams. But like, like I said, in waking reality, that's when you get the synchronicities, the omens, dream signs. Almost like they're, they're almost like waking dream symbols. Yeah, and that's what I talked about in my Dreamtime article. I talked about how not only are they, there are two sides of the same coin, but in the sense that you, I learned years ago that I could start interpreting some of the things that were happening to me in the quote-unquote real world using a dream dictionary. So I would have these strange things that were really happening to me back then, especially like in Fort Lauderdale, which we've touched on throughout this talk. Like that was a time period that was rife with weirdness, you know, all kinds of crazy things were happening and including my reality just kind of got a little weird. Just the everyday reality where some strange, like supposed real things would happen that were just out of place. Um, just kind of almost drawing attention to themselves. And so I would look that stuff up in a dream dictionary to see, and I was interpreting my everyday reality that's supposed to be real but interpreting it like a dream and it was, and it was accurate. It was working like it, it, because these things that these strange out of place things that I'd see during my everyday that were kind of drawing attention to themselves, being very pointed, it would end up meaning something. It, you know, I'd look up the meaning and it would pertain to other things that were happening to me. in again, this supposed real world. So yeah, that that's where I learned like, Hmm, <laughs> this really isn't as real as we want to think it is. You know, it, it, it's operating very much like a dream. Mm-hmm. Sometimes dreams can also be precognitive yeah. in, in the sense that they predict and you know, okay, sometimes you have a dream that's like a literal precognition of what's going to happen. But a lot of times your precognition in a dream is symbolic. 
maybe I don't know why, maybe it's because it comes from the right part of the brain or the sub subconscious and the subconscious isn't like all linear left brain literal, you know, maybe it's more symbolic and poetic and uh, visual. Um, but yeah, so sometimes you can dream something in a symbolic way that predicts something that's coming up. And likewise, in waking reality, you might have a synchronicity that is symbolically, at an archetypal level, it's symbolically related to a literal event that's coming up in your life. And I think you've had one of those two, didn't you? Yeah, the, um, you're, yeah, the, um, what we, we were talking about this earlier before we did the show, but we're talking about the bleeding ivy incident. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and I talked about this um, on my website in the Vortex write-up that I've mentioned now a few times, but um, I did mention it there, and people were probably listening going, what, a bleeding ivy? Like, what are you talking about? But, like, in, I would say, it was May to June of 2000, so this was over 20 years ago, um, me and my brother Joe, we moved into an apartment together, this two-bedroom apartment where we were mating, um, and right after moving in, long story short, I, you know, was decorating with some stuff and got a, an ivy plant, you know, I decided to buy a hanging ivy plant, like, oh, I'll just have this nice plant. So, you know, whatever, so weird things started happening with this plant. I put water in it. It was the craziest thing. And this red blood like stuff would come out. See water in blood out. That's why I call it the bleeding ivy plant. So I had this plant hanging in my room, which was carpeted. And I realized I can't leave the plant here with this weird stuff that's coming out of the soil because it's going to get on the carpet and stain and it really looked like blood it was like red it was like a red brown color and i i didn't understand like what is happening here i even called green thumb nursery where i bought the ivy plant just to ask them because i don't normally have plants i don't know anything about horticulture i'm like is this something that happens have you ever heard of this so i'm talking to the lady who answered the phone there and she was mystified. She had no idea what I was talking about. Like, I put water in it, and this weird red-brown-looking bloody stuff comes out of it. She never had heard of it. Probably thought it was a crank phone call. <laughs> so I didn't get any answers, and, just, you know, whatever. So I put it outside on the patio because I didn't know what else to do with it. The plant was still good. It wasn't dead. But, I mean, I can't leave it inside where there's carpeting. So I just put it on the patio for the time being until I could figure out what to do with it. Um, and meanwhile, at this point, all the bloody red stuff was coming out of the base of the plant overflowing out of the, the the little catch plate and it was getting all over the patio so it was all spread out and then it dried so it looked like like joe even said it looked like somebody got shot you know and like there's they bled all over the patio so we're both standing over it looking down at this dried red brown bloody looking stuff all over the right side of the patio you know, marveling, it really did look like someone, like something happened and they bled out. So that was May to June of 2000. So flash forward to May of 2001, when the big cop incident happened uh, with Joe, where he got into a verbal altercation with our next door neighbors in the next apartment. This guy was always like drunk and rampaging on his family. He was like a child abuser, a wife beater. So Joe was drunk that night and was mouthing off to the guy from our balcony over to his balcony where he, we could hear him inside rampaging on his family. So Joe was just, you know, screwing around and drunk and yelling stuff out at the guy. And long story short, the guy was yelling back and it was just back and forth. And Joe took his pellet gun, which was designed to look like a Glock. It looked like a real Glock, but it was a pellet gun and fired it off in his drunken craziness and I guess one of the pellets grazed the, the woman's arm. And, and she was a piece of work, too. She, she was also a child abuser. They were just crazy people. But they called the cops and were reporting it to the cops that Joe was firing a real gun off the balcony. So the cops show up thinking they got a crazy guy fighting, you know, firing a real gun at people. And, that, you know, that's not what was happening. So they showed up on the sidewalk. We're on the second story and they showed up down below our balcony on the sidewalk looking up at our apartment where Joe was, you know, and start trying to question the way cops do. And, you know, Joe is drunk and he's not cooperative and he's just being stupid and acting like a clown, basically. And he backed away from them on the patio and edged back towards the sliding doors. And he had his Glock looking pellet gun 
you know, in his back pocket and he reached behind him and pulled it out and kind of surreptitiously, you know, he went over to the side of the sliding door and dropped it behind the wall inside. And they later said they could see him reaching for something behind him and doing that. And they could hear it drop and clank against the wall. And it just, as far as they were concerned, this guy really did have a gun, you know, they could sound it and seem like a real gun. So now they're on just high alert from zero to 10 in like five seconds. They really think they are dealing with a guy with a real gun. So I could tell this was not going to end well. So, uh, you know, my brother, my little brother is out there on the patio ish in the doorway, you know, of the living room with this fake gun and the cops, there's two of them down there and they are on high alert and, you know, commanding him to, you know, stay where you are, put your hands on your head, you know, trying to get him to cooperate. And I'm like, this, this isn't going to end well. I mean, I already kind of knew he's going to get shot. Like my brother is going to get shot. And so I felt like I have to kind of go out there on the patio and try to defuse this situation. So I have to intervene. I can't let this happen. I'm not going to let it happen. So I did. I went onto the patio to try to intervene and defuse and, and kind of talk some sense into Joe, get him to co- start cooperating, like stop whatever you're doing, stop, you know, and he was really drunk. So his motor skills were really slowed down. His speech was slurred. So everything, his reactions were slowed down and he's not taking it seriously. And he's acting like it's a big joke with a smirk on his face. Like, you know, that languid kind of smirky like and I'm thinking you know he needs to knock it off because he's going to get shot and so that was even noted in the police report was that I you know was cooperative and I was trying to you know I was quietly talking to him standing next to me you know to get him to to calm down and, and just cooperate and when I first got out there I was on the right side of the patio and he was on the left <laughs> so and and then I don't know, some, Joe did or said something at some point, and that's where it just really turned, where both cops, they had their guns pointed at both, one each had, you know, at my head, and, and the other one had his gun pointed at Joe's head, so we each had a cop, you know, with guns pointed at each of our head with the bright flashlights that these guns have, and both of them kept screaming at us over and over, you know, don't move or we'll shoot, you know, look at the light, don't move, look at the light, keep your hands above your head. You know, they just keep yelling, keep your hands above your head, look at the light, do not move, you know, and threatening to shoot us. So I'm just standing, I feel like I'm in a dream. I'm like, I can't even believe this is happening. Like, so I got my hands up, Joe's got his hands up halfway up. He's still screwing around and not fully cooperating. And then at one point, the cop, one of the cops told me to switch places with him. So that quote, when I shoot your brother, you won't get hit. So I'm like, okay, so... (laughs) You know, like I said in the vortex, yeah, cops, you got to love them when I shoot your brother. Not if, but when. So I'm like, all right, fine. So I switched places with Joe. So now Joe was on the right side of the patio and I'm on the left. So anyway, long story short, obviously nobody got shot that night because I was able to just keep talking Joe down from it, just cooperate, do what they say. And meanwhile, another cop kind of came in through the apartment. They got a key from maintenance and came inside to get us and uh whatever i spent an hour and a half handcuffed in the back of a cop car that night um and joe was handcuffed until they could figure out what was going on and then they finally figured out there's no real gun involved that the people lied and these people had a long track record with the cops themselves because again child abuse domestic violence blah 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 so the cops were already well aware of these people but um but the point is that this was like it was bizarre that this Ivy plant was doing something that I have to this day never heard of a plant doing and even the people at the nursery had never heard of it and had no explanation but it's leaking a blood something that looks like blood and leaves a red brown blood stain all over the patio where almost a year later both of us would find ourselves standing there with guns pointed at our heads cops that were like seconds away from pulling the trigger thinking they were dealing with like people with real guns you know Um, and again, they switch places so that when I shoot your brother and then Joe was standing there. So I'm just saying, in in my opinion, it was almost like a bleed over, no pun intended from an alternate timeline where one of us did get shot. I don't know which one, but somebody got shot in my opinion. And it was like a synchronicity premonition bleed over. It's kind of all of this stuff wrapped together 
indicating the very alternate way in which this situation ended and did not end well. Somebody got shot. So, yeah. And like I said, to this day, I've never heard of a plant doing that, never encountered anything like that. But I think that's a really good example. Yeah. Yeah. It is uh, ironically appropriate yeah. to, to be a bleeding <laughs> plant for a bleed over. I know. <laughs> yeah. Blood, bleeding, bleed over. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's interesting how it just poetically kind of wraps in on itself like that. I know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it was interesting because it happened so far in advance, though. I've noticed like with regular synchronicities of the more benign variety, and I've said this in my synchronicities article, they tend to happen, they can happen almost instantly where it almost feels like reality is folding in on itself. So you have the first part of it and then the second part that reflects that is creating the synchronicity of these two things that line up, you know, and it can happen within seconds or it can happen within minutes, hours, a day to several days. And I, 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 I try to define in my article, like how far apart do the two things have to happen from each other in order to constitute a sync? Like what is the furthest amount of time that has to transpire between the first event and the second one that matches up? And my thing was like, for an average sync, it's usually at most about a week. So it can happen within seconds all the way up to about a week. But you get beyond a week and it's kind of like it's so far apart, the connection may not be obvious and it may not even qualify anymore as a connecting coincidence, you know, connecting meaningful coincidence. So I'd say up to a week. But in this case, this was 11 months in advance. You know, it was a uh, way in advance, but it is a synchronicity. But there's more to it than just your run of the mill sync. You know, it is almost like a parallel timeline bleed over manifesting in a very symbolic way, you know, and almost like a premonition as well. And it could have also worked as a way in which higher positive stuff, and this is just a, a really loose theory, I, I don't know, just tossing it out there for consideration, but where higher positive stuff is trying to get a message through to you, and they are, and it's a whole subject in itself, something that we've talked about in depth, but like, they're sometimes limited in how they can intervene for for various reasons some of it can be because of your karma and blah 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 there's times where they're allowed to just directly intervene and undo stuff and other times they have to allow negs to have the chance to do their thing but they get to try to also help you but it has to be allowed to potentially happen and again there's reasons for that it has to do with karma and other metaphysical stuff but Maybe in this instance, you know, that's what was happening as well. It's like a higher positive stuff is trying to convey a message, maybe put it in my subconscious that the idea of something happening on this patio, or I think, like I said, Joe, even Joe does, oh, it's like somebody got shot, you know, and bleeding, you know, getting shot, bleeding out some kind of a weird creepy. It was creepy. It was creepy. Even when we were looking at it, we were both creeped out. Like, what the heck is going on with this? So it kind of plants a seed in your subconscious. So all those months later, you're standing on a balcony and you got cops pointing guns at your head, threatening to shoot you and even saying, oh, when I shoot your brother. So maybe it registers on a subconscious. I don't know. So that you're trying to you make more of an effort, therefore, to get out there, try to defuse it, get him to cooperate to prevent this shooting from happening. Whereas maybe I didn't do it that way initially. Maybe I was more hesitant and kept inside and I didn't go out there. And then the worst case scenario happened. I don't know. So that's just a theory I throw out there. It might not be what was happening. Yeah, it could have been could have been intervention or it could have been like some symbolic foreshadowing. Yeah. Or several things in one. You never know. It could be more than one thing. But it was definitely something. It's not it's not a, just a coincidence that that happened because plants don't do that, you know. And I have had plants since then and a few before that, although I'm not really a big plant person, but I've never seen a plant do that. And I don't think anyone's heard yeah. of a plant doing that before. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, yeah, especially when it comes to death, you know, you can have sometimes you with death really creepy stuff, like really creepy omens or yeah, like like before my mom died uh, in in twenty twenty one, yeah, we had, and in like the three weeks leading up to it, we had a number of really bizarre synchronicities. Yeah, we did. <laughs> well, I mean, I know it started like when I was we were reviewing before we were doing the show, like going back and looking at the timeline of these um, sinks that happened, and it kind of started. Um, because your mom ended up passing it has to be no, it's september 13th that was that was when she passed so it, it started as far back as we can tell august 19th um the i still laugh because it just sounds funny the pork chop on the grass incident but yeah like 
we were standing on the our outside balcony we were just kind of hanging out and enjoying the afternoon and chatting and whatnot and then you looked down in the grass below our balcony and saw a huge pork chop <laughs> so just sitting there in the grass like, yeah, like, like a, a, not, not even like a half-eaten pork chop like no. a nice fresh raw pork chop right. just laden in this fresh green grass right and it was the most bizarre thing and i'm like huh and i'm looking down at it and i immediately was commenting that and of course not only is that bizarre that's never happened before but you have to notice it's right under our balcony, which, of course, I'm going to notice that. But secondly, I noticed, you know, it's funny, like if you hadn't said it, I wouldn't have even noticed it down there because I'm looking straight ahead and up and around, but I'm not looking down in the grass. So it's like and that's important to note because we're going to get back to that. There, there was this pattern that started to happen where you noticed it. I didn't see it. So, yeah, if you hadn't pointed out, never noticed it. But I got a picture of it. So we, we got a photo for posterity because it was so bizarre. But yeah. And then like. And then I just remember it was like about a week before she passed. I remember that you got your cell phone and you kind of joked to me as you were getting your phone, like, all right, well, I'm going to call my mom and make sure she's still alive, you know, <laughs> kind of joking, but also kind of not. And the thing is, your mom had had like all these health issues. Um, but at that moment, her health was stable. I mean, she's on dialysis and, and has diabetes and high blood pressure. But everything was stable. Yeah, and she had recently gotten checked out. She got an electrocardiogram, other things. Everything looked good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though she had bad health, she was stable. But you still make this joke. And, and what I've noted on like online, I've like on my gab, I've joked about how a lot of times your jokes, they're, they're kind of wry or sardonic, they're, they're often rooted in an actual premonition. So you're making a joke, but there's truth to it. Like there is a premonition, almost a precognitive thing happening that you're picking up on something that's about to happen and you're making a joke about it, but it's, it's based on truth. So yeah. and that, that ended up unfortunately being one of those examples where you wanted to make sure she's still alive. And of course, at that moment you called her, she was fine in mm -hmm. that moment. Everything seemed fine. You know? Yeah. The, the next one was like September 7th yeah. where I was at my desk, which was facing out the window, you know, out that same patio or yeah. in the same balcony area. Uh, and all of a sudden I hear a, a thump against the window, like the top left corner of the window. I heard something bang into it. My initial thought was, okay, you know what? It's probably some kid on the street. They threw a ball. It sounded like a ball hitting it. And then I went outside and looked down, and what is it? It's a morning dove, like on the ground, injured, that had like just like, flown into the window. And that's really strange because it's not like we, we got one of those super transparent windows that birds can't see, and they just smack into it. Right, and there's even an overhang, like because there's a hallway outside. Our, the, the balcony, when I say a balcony, it's really a hallway with a railing, and you stand, it's just the hallway. So there's this big overhang in a hallway. So it's just, we've never had a bird fly in like that. No, never. And we've been here for over a decade. Yeah, it's never happened. And the thing that was weird about this is, again, if you hadn't told me it happened, I would never have seen it because I'm on my computer, which is not, it's facing a different direction. And so I never saw this happen. So all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, like, and you're telling me that this, and I'm like, what? And I took, I had my headphones on and everything. So I'm on my computer, faced a different direction, had headphones on wasn't even paying attention and I had to take them off and I'm like whoa what happened what and then you're telling there's a bird just flew into the door in the corner and I'm like oh my god and I I went outside we went outside to go look at it and the bird was there it was just kind of stunned on the ground and as soon as it came out it it got scared and it flew off but it went through the railing and it hit its wings against the railings and I was like oh no like it sounded like it's gonna break its wings or something like so instead of flying over the railing it flew through the railing almost like their jail bars or something and it went through and you know and then, and then it was free and then it was free so it banged its wings against it and then so luckily it didn't break its wings it was able to still fly but it was it freaked me out you know the whole thing. And I just kept telling you like, oh my God, this is not good. This is not good because I'm definitely someone who believes in the idea of omens in our everyday life that are like the dream thing. And if this was a dream, that would be considered a bad ominous dream. And, but this, you know, it's no different in real life. So I just kept saying that over and over to you. Like, this is so bad. This is so bad. This is not a good sign because yeah. these things don't happen ever. And this is not a good sign. And you would, as it is, you had already made a joke joke and quotes about the pork chop being like like it's dead meat like so you were already kind of worried about it possibly 
being about your mom and indicating like, oh, dead meat, someone's dead meat. You know, you already saw that link, which I wouldn't mm -hmm. have even thought of myself. So, and then you made that joke about your mom and I hope she's still alive. I better make sure everything's, you know, and then this mourning, like dove is spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, like you're in mourning, you know, and that happened. And I knew this is a bad omen. And I realized too, at that point, again, just like I didn't see the pork chop, I didn't see this bird happen. So I began to realize whatever's about to happen, like first off, these are omens and they're bad and it's about you. It concerns maybe not you specifically, but something connected and about you. Like you, your family, it's, it's about you. It doesn't concern me. doesn't mean I won't get like overlapped in some way, but it's not about me. It's not about me and you. It's about you and something else relating to you alone. I could tell that about, so I even had said that to you at the time. I knew it at that point. This is about you because you're the one seeing these things. You know, I, I wasn't even seeing them, which ties back to what we were talking about before. Like you had said, Sometimes you can have people who are right next to each other in life, in reality, sharing the same space. And one person is clearly able to see something that the person right next to them can't see. So it's happening to one and not the other, even though they're occupying the same reality, supposedly, and right next to each other in the same space. And it, one person can see it and the other can't. So it's an interesting way that reality can play out. And even though me and you are very connected and I'm also psychic and I believe in, you know, omens and all that. I'm not seeing it. It's not happening to me. You know, it was happening to you right under my nose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing about synchronicities is that a lot of times they are targeted. They're meant for mm -hmm. one, one particular person. Yeah. So if it's a message for just one person, someone could be standing right next to them and they won't see it. Right. Or, I mean, of course, logically, isn't it might not mean anything to them because synchronicity requires a connection between an idea and an event. Right. And so if they don't have the idea, then the event means nothing to them. But um, actually, you know, the same thing happens with UFOs too, where people see only one person sees it. The other one is standing next to him and doesn't even notice or can't see it or, hmm. you know, so, so these weird outside the framework of the illusion phenomena, a lot of times it tends to not be synchronized across the subplots of each character that, right. that, that's in there. Yeah. So, you know, but it, but it gets even weirder though, because, uh, on September, the night of September 10th going into September 11th. I was up right around two, maybe four in the morning. Uh, I was online and likewise facing out that same window, uh, although the, the blinds were closed at that point. And all of a sudden, in the top left corner of the window, the exact same spot that the bird flew into, I see like a bright blue light coming through that, like a bright, bright, white, blue, almost like a flashlight, you know, like a, like a spot coming through that, that point. And I wonder like, what the hell is going on? So... I look out the window just in time to see a dark figure kind of go past the doorway. Uh, I didn't really catch a glimpse of it, but it's like a tall, dark figure. Well, I mean, and I assumed, okay, it's probably a cop. It's probably a cop looking, going like shining flashlights into windows for whatever reason. That's what I assumed. Although when I, lo when I fully went out there to look, I didn't see anyone. So if it was a cop, then he must have already gone down the stairwell and, and would have been gone by that point. Well, little did I know that... That exact same time period, um, what had happened was a mom back in Iowa, her neighbor downstairs had called the cops for a wellness check because the, the neighbor downstairs, who's actually the landlord, he heard the water running upstairs in the kitchen for hours. So my mom must have forgotten to do that. But, he, but you know, he, he was also kind of nervous about her passing away. So he called the cops. The cops had shown up. And so at that exact moment, I confirmed with her, the exact moment that she was in bed and she woke up to cops shining flashlight in her face is when the cop was shining a flashlight. Or what you assumed was a cop. Right. Okay. What I assumed was a cop. Even if you didn't confirm it, but right. the fact that you had that thought that it must be a cop, mm -hmm. that just is the same thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, right. Right. Yeah. So I did assume it and uh, shining a light in the exact same spot where the morning dove had flown into it. Yeah. Just, uh, just a couple days earlier. Yeah. And then, then it just got even crazy. Like the night of her death is, this is crazy. Because, like, that night, um, there was this bizarre, really interesting, bizarre lightning storm that happened. And keeping in mind that your mom was born in the middle of a lightning storm in right. Singapore. So this means something. And it was a very strange lightning storm, the likes of which I had never really seen before. You were inside, and I think you were on a phone call with your siblings that night, like a big group phone call. You're all just talking. 
And I was just marveling. I think, what, weren't you guys? Or was. Yeah, so that happened later, like after the funeral, when we were scattering the ashes. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. But that mm-hmm. night, I think you were on a phone call and I called you off, like, oh, you got to come see this. I think, weren't you on the phone? I don't remember. Maybe you weren't on the phone, but I w- came inside and I kept commenting, like, about the lightning. This is really weird. Like, it's really weird. And because I had just been out running an errand and I saw it on my way home, got inside and I kept commenting to you, you got to come check it out. And I think you were on the phone with your siblings. I'm not sure, but you got off the phone, I'm pretty sure. And you came outside to join me to check it out. And yeah, it was really crazy. Like the lightning, it was very, very frequent. So it just kept happening. And it was multiple strikes just going and going and going and going. Like, so it wasn't normal, just a lot of flashing lightning it was the multiple strikes thing that really got my attention. So I knew something was up with this lightning. And so we even got video of it and everything. And we've shown it to some people online and they were like, wow, it was just weird, you know? So, yeah. And, um, again, keeping in mind, she has that connection to a lightning storm. She was born in a lightning storm. And little did we know when this lightning was happening, she was in the middle of dying. So she died quote in a lightning storm. And we did not know this was happening for her back in Iowa. We're here in Florida and for she spent like almost 45 minutes we learned get trying to get revived by the paramedics um so in the middle of what was like so she was in the middle of dying all you know 1500 miles away and we didn't know it you also had a psychic thing where you felt different like yeah i felt different like I, all of a sudden i felt like lighter yeah. really positive really energized like uh yeah, like, like I felt like a weight had been lifted. Yeah. So I think I was picking up on her energy, possibly, or maybe she was communicating that she's all right, something like that. Yeah, so they were trying to revive her futilely, and I think she'd already crossed over, it seems. Mm-hmm. You know, her soul was out of her body and on the other side and feeling better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, free free from the pain, just like the, the, the dove that yeah. kind of flew through the iron bars. Yeah, like weird mm-hmm. s- symbolism there. Yeah, and then, and then at the moment that they pronounced her dead... We, we would find out like this lined up, you know. Yeah. This. Yeah, there was a there was an extremely loud thunder clap outside. Yeah, it was a huge scary. Boom! It was like an explosion. It was an explosion, and the power went out. Yeah. So the entire neighborhood was like pitch black. It was like dark and silent. Yeah. And uh, everything everything was like quiet. You know, there's not even any rain at that point. Right. It was just like dead silence. Just a huge explosion, then bam, black. Yeah, dead, <laughs> dead silence, and um, and then in the darkness, um. And then it came back on. It did come. I didn't stay off all night. It came on, like, I think within a few minutes. And then that's when the thing with the water. Yeah, that's happened. right. That's right. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden we hear from the bathroom. Something that had never happened before, mind you. This right. had never. So we didn't even know what was going on. We're like, what is this noise? Well, it turns out it was a water pipe making a crying, wailing noise. Yeah. Like, we'd, we'd never had that happen before. Yeah, just like a crying, wailing coming out of the bathroom all of a sudden. I checked in there and... It was connected. It's connected to the to the toilet, but also the pipes and the walls were somehow doing it. And uh, yeah, and this happened. I, th- I think that might have even happened during the power outage itself. You know, so it was like a huge boom, then a crying wailing noise from the water pipe, mm-hmm. which is interesting because my mom had left the water running during the wellness check. Yep. So because yeah, that's how I got the sound to turn off, I, I turned on the faucet, the water mm-hmm. faucet, to let the water run, and it made the the, the noise go away. <laughs> so that that was pretty. That was pretty bizarre. And so after the funeral, um, when we got the ashes back a couple of days later, my family and I, we went to the Mississippi River, which is where she requested her, her ashes to be scattered. Yeah, and um, as we were doing it, my brother says, oh, hey, look, look, look up there. And then we looked up and what, what do you know? It's my mom's face in the clouds during sunset. And, and there was lightning going on. And then the, later on that night, there was a huge amount of lightning Oh, okay, that around. was later. But then, yeah, the face in the clouds. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the face in the clouds. It's not just any face in the clouds. Like, it actually is her with the hair, the <laughs> Asian eyes, the, the Asian nose. Yes, uh, yeah. She has, a, she has a, you know, the squinty Asian eyes. If she, if, like, it was kind of smiling, so the eyes were squinty. And she has bangs. Mm-hmm. So it was like the dark, the dark bangs. And, yeah. and her smile, it was like your mom's face in a cloud. Yeah, so we're like looking at it, marveling at it. And the clouds are moving pretty quickly. So, you know, I said, oh, shoot, you know. I told my brother to go ahead and take a photo of it before it went too far. But by the time he got the photo, it was already kind of distorted. So you can still see it, but it didn't look as perfect as, as when we when we first saw it. And then, so then that night, um, yeah, so that night a storm kicked in. And my sister was in a separate part of town visiting a friend. But she also called me, said, hey, bro, look, look, look up at the sky. And we went out there and it's the exact same lightning that we saw here in Florida. But this was in Iowa. Yeah. Right. So, you know, totally different climate, different part of the country. 
And in both cases, we, all of us, we saw lightning that we had never seen before. Yeah. Connected to something about her, you know, the, the mm. day you're scattering the ashes. So Yeah. Yeah. So definitely these types of symbolic synchronicities definitely speaks to a collective dream aspect of reality. 